no. the Forbidden Alchemy is there. So definitely some targets from those cremates. Yeah, absolutely. I know that Ben actually thought that Esper was going to be big enough in this tournament that he was contemplating playing a main deck Psychic Spiral, but it looks like he's uh, actually just moved it to the sideboard. Okay. We do see that Ben is on six cards right now. Steven is trying to... He's on a mulligan to five. We're going to see if he's going to keep those five or if he's going to take a mulligan, but we are going to be underway here shortly. Again, Star City Games Open Series is here live in Milwaukee. If you guys do want to interact with us as we do begin the day, second of ten very long rounds at SCG Live, hashtag SCG MKE. Interact with us over the course of the weekend as we're going to be talking about spoilers. We have a huge announcement after this round, and you know we're going to talk about a lot of standard magic too. Yes. So it is going to be a blast as Ben starts off with a Goblet Shrine and a Fire Drown Yard, but no blue sources. Yep. And the opening on the, the Nathalia Drown Yard is often the last land played, so this is a pretty clear giveaway that Ben does not have a third land in hand. We're going to see Steve play a Blind Obedience and pass the turn back. Ben going to draw a card. Looks like he draws a Think twice and he just does kick it back. So as you said, pretty pretty telling when you do play the Drown Yard early that there is not another land in your hand and you're going to be playing off the top to try to hit those land drops. If he does draw a blue land, of course, he can start thinking once and thinking twice and undo his mulligans and his mana issues. So it looks like Steve is going for a Lingering Souls here. Yeah. Two Spirit Tokens are going to be coming in. We'll see if Ben can draw. He draws a Dissipate, so again without a land here. Not under not underneath a, a significant amount of pressure, but he does want to get that land drop, maybe get into a Supreme Verdict here and really get the ball rolling before he does get run over. But Steve's deck doesn't really put on a huge clock either. Yeah, the, the most concerning thing for Ben, I believe, is that Blind Obedience because it means that even if he does stabilize the game, that any random spell Steve plays is, is all going to add up. Yeah. So, you know, traditionally, Esper's in this position where if you're playing Supreme Verge and Detention Spearings, you can kind of just clear the whole game up. But the incremental damage of Blind Obedience might mean that Ben can stabilize the game and still get kind of burned out. And you are going to see one Extort Trigger for here from the Blind Obedience. His Lingering Souls is going to get flashed back. He's going to pay the one for the Extort Trigger. Two more Spirits are going to come into play. And Ben's Life Total is starting to become under duress a little bit here as he does draw another non-land card. It looks like he's going to have to discard something here. You see a Syncopate being pulled towards the forefront of his hand. Augur of Bola, Supreme Verdicts, a lot of things in his hand here. He's just going to discard Think Twice and pass the turn back with the idea that if I do draw Blue Land, I can't flash it back. Mm -hmm. Steve draws another Lingering Souls. Pretty excellent draw here with four mana in play. You can cast his Lingering Souls, extort again. All right, so here come those four spirits. Lundquist is going to move down to 13, likely 12 again, as you said, Pat, from that extort trigger, and two more spirits are going to be put on the battlefield. So pretty unfortunate mulligan here for Ben. I mean, mulligan's down to six, and keeps it just not able to draw a blue source. Steve had to take a mulligan down to five, of course, and it looks like a... Oddly enough, he's just doing better better than Ben is right now. I watched a lot of Ben play at the Invitational because I was quickly out of the tournament and Ben was making a deep run. And most of the losses I saw him take were just simply not having blue mana. Right? Sure. Sometimes I question whether or not these decks are supposed to have four copies of Nathalia Drown Yard in it, for example, because most of your losses in Mulligan simply come to just not having blue mana early enough in the game. You see another Lingering Souls get cast here with an Extort Trigger. So we're up to six spirits in play. to turn back Azorius Charm is the draw here so not only is he not drawing any blue land he's just not drawing any land period and he isn't going to concede the game so Martinic is going to be up a game here on a very uh, bit of a cripple fight there but yeah that was a, that was not the most explosive draw from either player obviously you know both players had mulligan so that was part of it too yeah. and neither deck is especially explosive yeah but Steve with his lingering souls and his blind obedience they're pretty easy able to wrap up that game against an opponent Offering no resistance. Well, we'll take a look at Ben's sideboard here, outside of drawing land, see if he can put up any more resistance, as he only did see Blind Obedience and Lingering Souls from Steve. Anything anything spicy over there, or something that's certainly going to be obvious to help him? Well, part of the problem is Steve's deck is a little bit on the weird side, and Ben did not see a ton of cards, so it's hard to make too many conclusions about what's going on. That said, I think that he can be pretty comfortable in bringing in a Curse of Death Hold, so you've seen Lingering Souls, Couple copies of Negate, pretty safe against what, broadly speaking, appears to be a control deck. Sure. Probably has a variety of spells. A single Duress seems safe to me. And uh, that, I believe, looks like the about it. I mean, Ben's got a lot of flexible sideboard cards here. 
Does he want a singleton purify the grave? Probably not. But again, he's seen some amount of graveyard interaction. Does he want a singleton appetite for brains? You can assume that there are some expensive cards in Steve's deck, you know. But it's hard to draw too many conclusions based on what you've seen. The Blood Crypt that Steve plays is especially, would, you know, if I'm in Ben's position, I'm especially like, he's playing some weird brew. Sure. You know, there's not any sort of really conventional deck playing Lingering Souls, Blind Obedience, and Red Spells. Yeah. So you can only extrapolate so much from what you've seen in the in the game. It's kind of easy to try to put him on maybe the Aristocrats Act 2. Um, maybe he has just like one Miser's Blind Obedience in his deck. You know, you could try to put them on something of that nature. Right, yeah, it's actually, you're correct, it's actually totally reasonable to assume that Steve is playing some sort of Falcon Wrath Aristocrat deck, and that's not even close to being the case. Yeah. That's not what he's up to at all. Yeah. So uh, if Ben brings in you know, his three copies of Tragic Slip, anticipating that Falcon Wrath Aristocrat is there, they, that, those could end up being very poor draws. Yeah, as we used to take a look at the Angels, Serendius, the Olivia Voldarens, and, and the Obsidats, all two of us, not very good Tragic Slip targets. As we do take a look at Steve's sideboard here, of two Gloom Surgeon, two Liliana the Veil, four Human Frailty, two Merciless Eviction, four Devour Flesh, and one Orzhov Charm. Not sure if he knows he's playing against Esper. I think it, there's a bit of a giveaway now that you saw the Drown Yard and the Discard to think twice. He probably does. Probably has a pretty good idea what sure. he's up against. And if he does know Ben at all or just follow the Open Series, he knows this is what Ben top it with last weekend. So of the cards that he can bring in, the only ones that are really appealing, at least in my opinion, are those two copies of Liliana of the Veil. Devour Flesh, Gloom Surge, and Human Frailty, Merciless Eviction, much more, of course, for creature matchups. And the Orzhov Charm, while it does provide flexibility, um, doesn't really stand out as an all-star against an Esper strategy. Yeah, I mean, Steve appears to be using most of his sideboard equity fighting aggressive decks and human Naya especially. I don't know if that matchup is especially bad for him or if he's anticipating a lot of it, but he's certainly using a lot of his sideboard slots trying to shore up those kind of matchups. Doesn't have really that much to bring in against Esper, although Liliana the Veil has the potential to be a haymaker. Yes. Uh, only two of those in his sideboard, of course, but yeah, I think of any card that he's going to want to bring in, it's going to be those. Not sure what he's going to want to sideboard out. You know, he does have these four mutilates in his deck. Those aren't going to be those aren't going to be all that great. Maybe you see him sideboard down to two of those. Maybe you see him sideboard in the gloom surgeons for the other two. You know, he's got a he's got some options here. Not a ton of them, but he does have to find some sort of room for those Lilianas. And, and mutilate seems like they'd probably be the first card to go. Yeah, uh, yeah, the uh, the sweeper against the basically no creature deck. Not where you not where you would want to be lined up. Yeah. So we'll see if uh, the next game or games can be what is probably a more accurate reflection of this matchup, which is a grinded out affair, uh, games that are not going to end very early at all. Uh, yes, Steve does have Lingering Souls in his deck to kind of put some pressure on Ben, along with some creatures here in Obsidat and Olivia Voldaren, but I expect, you know, th this match and these next couple of games to, you know, go 10 plus turns each. Yeah, in general, in these kind of matchups, I, I really would like to be on the Esper side of things, because a deck that's fairly slow, that's trying to grind you out with contextual card advantage, you know, cards like Lingering Souls and Angel of Serenity and Obsidat, I would much rather have Sphinx's Revelation in my deck and just try to win the game that way than try to have my threats and answers line up correctly, you know, one for one while gaining value. That's sort of the deck that Steve has, and I think these decks are just fundamentally not favored against a deck like Esper. Yeah, Steve's deck's, Steve's deck's kind of weird because, you know, it, there's like a lot of things going on here. It, it feels like it kind of wants to be an Esper deck, but it doesn't have Nefalia Drown Yard. He does have like these three copies of Sphinx Revelation in his deck, but they don't play nearly as well as they yes. do in Ben's deck. Right, it's, it's not the same thing. It, you know, Ben's much more streamlined, card draw, counter spells, now Revelations to bury you. Yeah. Whereas in Steve's deck's Revelations, it's just kind of another power card, but it's a lot less efficient when you're drawing a bunch of Obsidats and Prophetic Prisms and Mutal. It's just not the same level of efficiency that it has in Ben's deck. Nor, nor is it such a, nor is it the same level of backbreaker yes. as it would be for men's deck, which, you know, that might that might be how these games end up playing out. Alternatively, one thing that you know Ben can do, and he doesn't know about this with Steve's deck, is Ben can actually win the fight against Sphinx's Revelation, where Steve's deck cannot because Steve doesn't have a card like this spell uh, to be able to, you know, have a battle over Sphinx's Revelation. So almost certainly Ben's Revelations are going to be better than Steve's in these next couple of games, provided we do get to go see a third game. Yep. If Steve was backing this up with a bunch of duresses, then we would be having a different conversation. Yes. But. And now we do see Ben with a Hollow Fountain, so he will get to play blue spells this game. Lucky, lucky, as Ben, excuse me, as Steve does draw a sign in blood for his turn. He's going to lead off with a Godless Shrine pass the turn back. Ben is ready up here at the stage. This is a last call for you see a you see a drowned catacomb in Ben's hand, among other things. Look like we see an Azorius charm over there. 
As you said, Patrick, there is a decent chance that he does sideboard into an, you know, an, an anti-aggro package. This is going to play the Drowned Catacombs. We'll see if he has a turn two play. He's just going to pass the turn back again because it, it, his Steve's deck looked like an Aristocrats type deck. Yep. One mulligan of five. Ben has to rest in his hand, but I think he's trying to sandbag it for you know a later spot. He doesn't want to fire it off just now. Probably wants to cycle. And you are going to see a sign in blood here from Steve's. Ben is going to negate that. Says no, thank you. You do not get to get any card advantage against me. Ben is going to draw a card. He is going to duress here. We're going to see a swamp, two copies of Watery Grave, a Prophetic Prism, a Drowned Catacomb, and a Lingering Souls. So that's actually two Catacombs, one Watery Grave to go with that swamp, Prism, and Lingering Souls. Unless Ben is really tied up on mana, I'm a little surprised to see him counter that Sign in Blood just because Steve has to discard. It's just draw two, discard one because he's on the draw. Sure. But it could just be an issue of mana efficiency. He was willing to use it on kind of whatever. So the choice here, uh, yeah, I, I felt like he was going to take the prism. You know, taking lingering souls is kind of backwards slash counterintuitive, as he's going to take, uh, he's going to take the opportunity here to cast an auger of Volos. Sphinx's revelation is going to go to Ben's hand. Devour flesh, and another card going to go down to the bottom. Ben basically saying, oh, I have to, currently I just have to beat a lingering souls, and with the configuration of his hand, he seems more than comfortable to be able to do that. Yeah, it's. Would, do you feel like you'd rather have two one one flyers or have him draw a random card? Yeah, it's pretty much what the what the conversation is. Ben feels like he would rather play against the two one one flyers. And so we are going to see the first half of the lingering souls here from Steve. Two spirit tokens going to come into play as Ben is going to untap. He's going to draw a godless shrine. I see a water grave in his hand as well right now, and an Azorius charm. So. Just trying to do what Esper does, which is to get into those late, get into that late game. So you're going to see another Augur of Volus here. Think twice is the card he's going to take. Restoration Angel and a Land are going to go to the bottom. First Augur of Volus. Not only did he find a card, but now it's a tough guy. Yeah. Now, and, and this is sort of what we we're talking about during the sideboarding. Just you're seeing the efficiency with which Ben's deck generates extra cards. This is all. This all has the potential to just chain into a devastating revelation. Mm -hmm. It's much harder for Steve's deck to cobble together the same sequence because he's, instead of drawing card drawing spells that finds more lands and more card drawing spells, he's drawing, he drew an Olivia last turn, he drew a Blind Obedience this turn. These are just sort of disconnected pieces. You know that the Olivia in his hand, he does not have a red source to be able to cast that, so right now he can only play that Blind Obedience and, you know, of course, flashback that Lingering Souls, and that's what he's going to start his turn with. Get two more spirit tokens out there. You saw Lundquist play that Godless Shrine that untapped, the likely just to be able to cycle that Azorius Shrine, but again, just build that velocity and get through his deck faster to that backbreaking revelation. And an unexpected upside there of Ben taking the Prophetic Prism is now there's an Olivia stranded, uncastable in the hand. You take a look at Steve's mana base here, looking for red sources. There are four copies of Blood Crypt. Outside of that, he does not have any other red, so he's drawing the four cards here in addition to those three other prophetic prisms. So Olivia Valderin could be stranded there for a rather long time. Yeah, uh, the way that Steve's constructed his deck, he has to play a ton of swamps to enable Mutilate, mm -hmm. and that leaves him in a position where he can't play Dragon Skull Summit and similar cards that he wants his Mutilate to be as powerful as possible. So we're going to see Ben cast a Think twice here. See a Hollow Fountain in his hand, still has that Azorius Charm as well. Just getting through his deck, making sure he can hit those land drops, making sure that you know he can find a Supreme Verdict or something else. He's going to play a Water Grave and get in with those two Augur Bolas. Put Steve down to 17, just so that he can get himself stabilized. Going to use you know his life total as a resource here. Yeah, although he has to be a little more conservative with his life total than you would normally be in control mirror matches because Blind Obedience is in play. Sure. It is not. It is not a free for all. Just Often in Esper mirrors, you see people playing land, dual lands on tap all the time, just to have more mana to fight with syncopates and that sort of stuff. Ben needs to be a little more careful than that because of blind obedience. So we are going to see a cremate here with the extort trigger. He's going to target. Looks like be a, look, probably one of those think twices. That's what I would assume. A little surprised that Ben didn't play that water grave untapped with the ability to flash back a think twice. Maybe he's just completely comfortable cycling an Azorius charm here and yeah. just moving on. And it's sort of the point of I did, what the point was that I just spoke to is with Blind Obedience in play, it's actually a a cost for Ben to be pulling his dual lands on tap. So I think in a lot of circumstances he would be happy to. Do we just we Azorius charm on the token? Yeah, so he put okay. he put he puts a 
Azorius Charms choosing to put an attacker on the top of his deck, so he wants to make it so there's one less Lingering, Lingering Souls token out there. And as you said, he maybe is a little bit concerned about his life. Yep. Just wants to be give himself as much breathing room as possible. So Try to get in a position where we're revelating for four, maybe, and then we can sort of enter the next phase of the game. You see those two Augur Bulls come across. Ben going to play a Hollow Fountain. He's going to pass the turn back. Steve is going to untap. He's going to take a draw step momentarily here, and we'll see what he's able to find for his draw, which is a Drowned Catacomb. So still without a red source here for his Olivia Valderin. Could really use a Prism here. He would get an Extort Trigger. Then be able to get the Olivia in play. I don't know. New card wouldn't hurt. Yeah. As it stands, we're just leaning on these Lingering Souls tokens to try to take us home. Yep. And when that revelation's looming, it's a, it's a tough way to, tough fight to win. So we'll see Steve play a Watergrave tap and just pass the turn back. So not even going to see an extort here from Steve as Ben is going to flash back a thing twice, get himself a new card. And that Watery Grave being played tapped from Steve's side actually subtly matters a lot. Because if Steve had revelations in his hand, his own revelations, his lands would almost certainly just be coming to play on tap. Yeah. With him playing that dual land tap, Ben can, from his perspective, no longer really worry about revelations being in his hands. Sure. Which is why I think you saw Ben pause a little bit there on Steve's end step, processing the information of, all right, revelations is not something I have to worry about right now. How do I want to use my mana? Now, the interesting thing here for Ben, of course, we're working with perfect information here in the booth, as are you guys at home is that you see Steve's mana base right now. He's got some cards in his hand. He's, he's, he's got these Lingering spirit, lingering Souls tokens. He's got this Blind Obedience, and he's got all this blue mana in play. So is Ben going to play around a card like a Negate, like a Stink of Fate, like a Dispel for his Revelation, or is he just, you know, is, is he just going to jam it uh, and say, if you have a Counterspell, you have a Counterspell? He could certainly run into an, a situation where he does play a little bit more conservative, where if he knew what exactly Steve was doing, he would not even think twice about, uh, about casting this Revelation. Yeah. But see, he is going to just pull the trigger on Revelation for four, so no fear of a counterspell here. So we found, was that like an Azorius Charm and some lands? Uh, another, another Revelation. revelation. Yeah. So he's starting to do what Esper does, which is chain Revelations together. So here come those Augur of Bolas yet again. Two more damage going across to Steve. You see Ben looking through his handful of cards. He's going to play an Isolated Chapel. He may or may not have to discard, but he is at seven cards. Lingering Souls tokens will untap. And another, another useless land from Steve here. And I'm going to guess it doesn't tap a red mana either. No. That is a Drowned Catacomb, it looks like. So we're going to see another huge revelation here from Lundquist. This one for five, so five more life and five cards. And you got to figure at some point he's probably going to find some sort of way to get rid of these tokens and just be safe. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if he cut a couple, but not all of his Supreme Verdicts. And he also has found an Oblivion Ring, which is really helpful too, because... That, that Blind Obedience is basically the last con real concerning card that Ben has to worry about here. I don't know if he's going to pull the trigger on it this turn, but it's a nice catch-all to have. So let's see what one twist is going to do this turn. He's just, just going to discard, discard yeah. Lands. Okay. So not willing to pull the trigger on the Oblivion Ring just yet. See a couple of Zorius charms. I think we see three Zorius charms in his hand. Yeah, we do. Isolated Chapel. You see, it. yeah, you see him pulling a Zorius charm. You see him pulling Ultimate Price. He might actually just be perfectly comfortable just picking off these tokens. Yep. You know, with Zorius charms and Ultimate Prices and stuff like that. A little surprised because that's his plan for to see him discard Ultimate Price. So it may not be his plan. We'll see how he wants to navigate as we see. What card are you? I think we're still able to make out artwork for a card in a little while. Yeah.
Well, we'll figure out what that card that Steve just drew this turn in just a moment. Yeah, I actually don't. I could not yeah. actually identify I have, that artwork. I've never been that stumped before. <laughs> All right, so Ben looks like he's going to take the three points of damage. Still not willing. Another revelation in his hand. It looks like it may be a devour push. No, that's not. That's definitely not what it is. He does just pass the turn back. So we will find out. We will wait and find out with bated breath as we see another huge revelation here for Lundquist. This one for six. So Ben is going to draw six more cards, gain six more life. Again, happy to discard. Just basically sculpting right now. Yeah. Once he's this, once he gets enough far ahead on mana and cards, he can just start winning with Drown Yard and picking apart attackers as they sort of come up here. Yep. You see a syncopate in Ben's hand right now. Like a Jace. Yeah, this might be the old five mana Jace memory adept. You see Ben starting to organize his mana a little bit here. Moves the Drown Yard over. He's making sure that he has access to all the mana and spells that he wants to be able to cast. Here is your Jace Memory Adept, the card that we'll bring up on the screen for you guys. It took a little while, Patrick, for this to make waves, but it has started to do so in a big way. Yeah, and you know that this this just this Jace got dogged on a little bit when it got previewed, just because unlike Ballerin and uh, Mind Sculptor, it's not completely over the line busted. <laughs> yeah, but this card is still very good. Big Trump and Control Mirrors. You know, if you're early on in the game, you're able to land this. You can draw some cards. Uh, and then transition to milling. Or if you're at the stage we're at right now where Ben's already drawn a bunch of cards, he can just start going right after Steve's library, which is what you see right now. So we are going to see an activation here. Ten cards will be turned over for Steve. And this is actually very helpful for Ben in a number of respects. Number one, this Jason is almost certainly going to carry the game home. But secondly, now we actually will get full information on what's actually going on in Steve's deck. Based on what we've seen in the first couple of games here, Ben still, you know, if you're in his seat, you still can't draw a full conclusion on what Steve's deck is really up to. You know, there's still the question we had, Welcome Wrath Aristocrat, is it there or not? Ben it can't be 100% sure answering that question either way. Winning uh, through milling here is going to give him the information that he needs to sideboard appropriately for game three. And so now he does see what Steve's deck is up to. He sees an Angel Serenity, he sees an Obzadat, he sees the Sphinx Revelation and a, another Prophetic Prism. So now he's got a much better idea of what Steve's deck is doing, which is kind of a mismatch, four-color, control, good card deck. Yeah. And so now he can sideboard appropriately, where maybe Ben did bring in Tragic Slips, and we just haven't seen them yet. But now if he did, he knows that he can certainly sideboard them out, as Blood Crypt is the draw for Steve this turn, giving Ben more information once he does probably cast Salivia Volder. Yes. You do see Lundquist. He does pull a uh, does pull a Restoration Angel forward in his, land, in his hand. You see Glacial Fortress and some other things here. So, you know, he can still go with the damage plan. Maybe the Olivia will change some things. But he looks like he could also be just on the mill plan. So you're going to see Jace move down to one here. I think you're going to see, as long as that attack doesn't kill the Jace, I think you're going to see Ben just try to pass this turn with as much mana up as possible and then make a concerted effort to protect Jace the following turn. Yeah. With a defensive Restoration Angel, some Azorius Charms, what have you. Fire all those bullets, finally. Yep. Ah. So our Twitter followers have told us that that mystery card in Steve's hand is a Garrick versus Liliana Mutilate. Okay. <laughs> of course it is. How sure. do we not know that? We've tested that matchup a lot. We thank you, Time Twister 7. Good looking out. Yes. I think Steve is contemplating casting a Mutilate before casting his Olivia. Attention players in Legacy Winbox number one. Your event is ready up your Here's our blood trip. Once again, players in Legacy Steve going to move down to six, which is certainly not irrelevant at this point. The Esper deck typically does not win through damage, but with how this game has shaped up, it's realistic. Yeah, I think we're probably going to see a, see you get milled out this game would be my guess, as it's just not worth, from Ben's perspective, it's not worth using his resources to try to fight that kind of fight. But Steve is getting low. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's a consideration he has to have now. 
Although I think we're going to see this blind obedience pull him up a little bit. And we're going to see an Olivia Voldaren with a blind obedience trigger. The extort will be paid. You'll see a little drain, a little gain. And then we'll see what Lundquist is going to want to do on Steve's end step. And if anyone wants to fight over this card, not sure if he has to dissipate in his hand or not, even yeah. if he cares about Olivia. I think I saw a bunch of copies of uh, Syncopate, but sure. no dissipate. I would be surprised. I think Ben kind of has the tools to to work around this Olivia, and he just wants to hold that hard counter as long as possible. So here's the thing twice, going to get flashback. And Ben is going to untap all those lands. Along with those two copies of Augur Bulls, so he's going to take a draw step here. Finds a Glacial Fortress. Nathalia Drown Yard was the draw off of the Think Twice as well. So a little bit land heavy. But again, when you do draw four, or five, and then six cards off three Strings Revelations, <laughs> you've probably sculpted your hand in such a way that, you, that you're going to be okay. So I assume we're going to see another. We're going to see Jason Mill for 10 again. Yeah, I think. Uh, I, I believe Ben. Thumbed a uh, Sphinx of Revelation towards the front of his hand. Looks like he wants to maybe reset here as he does tap a couple of lands. It's going to be an Oblivion Ring. That's going to start the show. Olivia's going to bite the dust. Ben going to come across for two more. This might be an all-time record here for amount of damage Augur Moles has dealt in the game. <laughs> as we're going to see a mill for 10, it looks like. Yep, so here goes 10 more cards for Steve. And again, as you said earlier, just a lot more information here for Ben. As Ben is actually just going to, Ben says, I'll just take those. Because I don't really know what's going on over there with your deck. It so looks you, like he's also brought in Merciless Eviction yeah. as well. So you, do, you see Detection Sphere, Blind Obedience, a Mutilate, a Watery Grave, a Cremate, Eviction, Obsidat, Sign and Blood, and an Isolated Chapel. Looks like Lundquist is happy to just pass the turn back. So, we're, as you said, we're probably going to see that protection here of, uh, of of Jace. You take a look at Ben's lands. He does have one, two, three, four, five, six. He has eight mana, enough to actually cast Restoration Angel, blink on your bed, and cast two Azorius Charms. Although, Steve has just drawn Speaker's Revelation here, which is a gigantic draw. Sure. Is ready. If, if, only saying the two at Jace. And leaving one layer of soul back. So one quest gonna Azorius Charm one, you got Azorius Charm the other one, so just get those things out of here. Don't touch my Jace. And if Steve had sent that third spirit, that probably would have induced a restoration angel from yep. Ben. And then we would have a door open for a huge revelation which might actually pull Steve back into this game. As it stands, I don't think Ben's ever really going to tap his mana in such a way to leave his guard down. Steve might want to try to play around Syncopate here, but then his revelation is just not going to be for very much, for very many cards. And so you do see him thumbing a lot of mana here. It's going to be a mutilate to clear things up. We'll see if Ben is okay with this or not. As Patrick, I am being informed that Augur of Bolas was friends with Rune Champ just quite back in the day. So actually not a record. Solo. Yeah, solo. but I think that's yeah, a solo this, mission. Yeah, this is a solo act here by Augur of Bolas. This is most without a little help. So we're going to see Steve pass the turn back here. Let's see if Ben's willing to pull the trigger on just a 3-4 flash. Well, he also has a Drown Yard at the ready, too. Yeah. I mean, he's got a lot of things, a lot of paths to pursue here. He can try the rarely seen mill you out while applying lethal. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Have both ends covered. So we're going to see a mill for 10 here. And this Jace is really just shutting the door on Steve even really getting to revelate because he just doesn't have enough cards in his library. Yeah. What can he really revelate into? And if he does yeah. cast a huge revelation, he's basically attacking, he's dealing himself damage because his life total is now his library. And you're seeing Ben display a lot of patience here. There's, I, I think a lot of players who have just, you know, fired off that Restoration Angel or tapped out to Drown Yard, whatever, Ben's taking this position of, I'm way ahead in the game. I don't need to risk anything. Even if there's cards I can't think of off the top of my head that I should be playing around, I'm just going to err on the side of caution. 
But you are going to see that Sphinx of Revelation get syncopated for one. Ben did check how many cards Steve had in his library as he did cast that Revelation. Again, Steve, yes, he'd be drawing cards, but he'd also be dealing damage to his library, and that's the avenue that Ben is pursuing here. So Ben wanted to check just to see how many cards he has left, how many cards he'd be drawing if it does change the math. Decides to syncopate for one. The Sphinx of Revelation does get exiled, and you do see that Steve's going to take a look at his graveyard here. See, do I have any lingering souls down there, perhaps? that I can try to turn this game around with, but it does look like Jace, Memory of Death, is going to mill another opponent out, and I think uh, very shortly here, Patrick, we're moving on to a third game. Yep. Between that Jace and those uh, Nathalia Drown Yards, there's not going to be very much library left for Mr. Resnick. I'm really surprised that Steve has ported in... All right, so we're going to see a Prism and a Blind Obedience trigger. We'll see if he's going to pay for the limit. Sure, I see two mana tap. We're just going to see Ben negate that. And the reason to negate that there is he doesn't want Steve to draw into a creature that's relevant. Yeah, who knows what he right. could draw into. And that's just going to earn the concession. Yeah. So Lundquist is going to win game number two as we do have about 20 minutes left on the clock here for game number three. Time, a bit of a factor. We do have two very slow and plotting control decks here with Sphinx's Revelation. Yeah, although Ben has gotten very good at playing this deck in an efficient manner. As you see Ben pulling some uh, Supreme Verdicts towards the front of his deck now that he's seen the contents. Yeah. Which is a huge part of playing a deck like Esper proficiently in tournaments is just being able to play in a timely fashion because the matches that you draw are often going to be matches that you would have won had you had more time. Yes. And so it's very important to become proficient at playing the deck, not only making the right decisions, but also being able to come up with, with those decisions in a reasonable time frame. There's also times where it's correct to be willing to play a little bit less correctly in exchange for being able to play a lot more fast in certain spots. And that's another skill to have too, is knowing when to flip the switch of, I have to stop paying attention to the way that I'm tapping off my mana. I had to stop paying attention to pulling through my graveyard every single end step looking for Think Twices or thinking about Snapcasters because it's just more important for me to just mill this guy out as fast as I possibly can. I'm a little bit concerned of this matchup, kind of from Steve's side at this point. Not only do I think he's not favored just in terms of the, his 75 cards against Ben's 75 cards, but showing the amount of board control that he had in his deck, he not only had copies of Mutilate left in his deck, but he also brought in copies of Merciless Eviction. Makes me feel like he's just has too many cards that have little to no impact on Ben's game plan if Ben is just devoted to Revelations, counter spells, and Jinx. Yeah, which is what the Esper deck is certainly designed to do in this matchup. There's, he's not going to be able to outboard control Ben, and, and not only that, he doesn't need to. Yeah. He can't outboard. Uh, he can't outboard control him because Ben can see more cards per game, and he doesn't need to do that. That's not the angle of attack that he needs to take. And are, are you willing to trade Merciless Eviction for uh, a Jace Memory deck? Maybe you are, but you don't. You certainly don't need to bring in a ton of those. Yes. You know, he does have two copies of him in his sideboard, I, but I don't even like... I, Ben's basically proven he knows what he wants to fight over, and I don't think it's going to be Merciless Eviction. Yeah, I think that Steve's best game plan in this matchup actually involves line of BDNs, Lingering Souls, sort of nickel and diming him, forcing Ben a little bit on the back foot, and then landing some of his own haymakers, whether it's his own revelation, whether it's Obsidat, something like that. Yeah. Trying to out-control Ben in this matchup is not a fight I think Steve is equipped to, to handle. No. You see both players are going to keep their seven. Steve is going to lead off with a Blood Crypt. Ben goes with a Watery Grave. And we are underway here for game number three. As we're going to see a Drowned Catacombs. He's going to follow that up with a Sign of Blood. So two cards are going to go over to Steve. I believe Steve, Steve's hand has at least one copy of Mutilate. Yeah, I think they're, as you see Merciless Eviction and Prophetic Prism are the draws here. And it does not look like he has a third land in his hand. As Ben is going to draw a card, he is going to play... As you see a Hollow Fountain and a Fire Drown Yard in his hand, and it's going to pay two. Hollow Fountain's going to come down. And he is just going to pass the turn back. So Steve's going to draw a card. He draws another Merciless Eviction. And this is exactly what you're talking about, Patrick, where he does have two copies of Mutilate and two copies of Merciless Eviction in his hand. Yes, he doesn't have any lands, sure, as he's going to play Prophetic Prism and try to draw into one. But th those are virtual mulligans yes. at this point in the game. So really, how good a what? Yes, he does have cards, but how good of cards are they actually? So Prophetic Prism is going to draw a card. He's going to draw a Godless Shrine and then pass the turn. Ben briefly did consider countering that. Yeah. 
And I think Steve there might want to give a little shovel of his cards. The way that he played the prism and then played that shrine, I think he, he's pretty clearly signaling that he has no more lands in his hand. But he does peel off another one in the form of Isolated Chapel. And so here is your chapel. Let's see if we're going to see a Lingering Souls here. Has Ben opted not to play that Goblet Shrine on tap to maybe bluff a Dissipate, maybe cast a Syncopate for one? So here are two Spirit Tokens. And you do see a Syncopate in Lundquist's hand. This is going to draw a Restoration Angel here for the turn. The value Drawing Artist is going to be his land. We'll see, he's just gonna leave the shields up. Steve with a cremate on the end step. I see. assume we're firing this off on our sign of blood. Yeah. I don't think Lingering Souls would be the most uh, prime <laughs> target there. Perfect analysis for you, sir. Glad to have you back in the booth. Hey, this is just this is what I do. That's right. I make this look easy. <laughs> As Angel of Serenity is the draw for Steve's turn. Again, no land. Here, so no fifth land. Here come your two spirit tokens to start the turn. As Lundquist can pull the trigger on a Restoration Angel, but again, he does just want to leave those shields up. Let's see, let's see what Steve's going to follow up with his I second main phase. Okay, so he's going to lead with Lingering Souls here? And what were you going to say? Well, I, 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 like test, I like testing Ben out here. Maybe he'll counter Lingering Souls, and then you can land your Blind Obedience. Blind yeah. Obedience seems very important to land, even though Steve's hand's not very well set up right now. It seems, to me, it seems integral to his overall game plan. As Blind Obedience is going to resolve as well, so Ben is just going to take the opportunity to play a 3-4 Flying Flash in Restoration Angel. Quickly untaps. Don't see a land in his hand right now, so we're going to see Azorius Charm get cycled main phase. Ben is going to draw a fresh card. It's a Think Twice, so we don't see a land here. And one thing you also see is that he tapped in such a way that he doesn't have blue mana to actually cast Think Twice. Again. Yes. So maybe a maybe a bit of a planning error there. Yeah, that's and that could be disastrous here if Steve is able to land off that. You see that Ben has a negate and a syncopate, just a, a blue cards in his hand that he doesn't need to cast. And we're going to see a lingering souls here. We're actually going to see an Orzhov charm. Excuse me, taking care of the angel with a. Uh, blind Obedience Trigger, so if he had Negate, then he would have certainly cast it. Yep. So maybe a small hiccup there from Lundquist. He could also be enticing, we don't quite know. Now here come your four Spirit Tokens, as you guys do see Orzhov Charm on the screen. The Charm with many modes, as Ben does draw a Dissipate for the turn. Yeah, I have to imagine that was just a mistap. So now we'll see Think Twice. Ben draws a Restoration Angel. Again, not a land. Having mana troubles again in this match. We saw game one where he did take that mulligan of six and only did have two lands. He was never able to find a blue source to be able to play his spells. And he's going to discard a Sphinx's Revelation and pass the turn back. So again, this is how we saw Steve win game one on his mulligan of five Lingering Souls. In addition to a little bit of pressure there from Blind Obedience providing a little bit of inevitability. inevitability excuse me. And here comes those four spirits yet again. Did not have the timely Orzhov charm in game one, but did he, he didn't need it. Yep. Yeah, like I said, I, I feel like this is the kind of this is the kind of game that Steve is is equipped to win, even though he's on a very he's on a contextual mulligan to three at this point, as he has two merciless evictions and two mutilates in his hand. What he does have is Olivia and Valderin. No extort trigger because he does not have a fifth land. So we're gonna see a syncopate for one. Ben is going to counter that. Slow down the clock a little bit. Quickly untaps. He draws a card. It is an Oblivion Ring. He has no Supreme Verdict. Nope. Now, O-Ring here is certainly certainly not bad, as it's almost worth taking out that of Blind Obedience. But if you take that out, you put yourself down three from those Lingering Souls tokens, you're in a bit of trouble. So, you know, does he need the cantrip here? Oh, he has... He has uh, I think he's got he's curse, curse in his hand. Yeah, yeah he's got Curse of Death Hold in his hand here. So he's just really trying to hit that land drop to be able to cast yep. Curse of Turns the game around in a huge way. He has a Demir Charm in his hand. So he just passed the turn back. Okay. It's a big draw for Steve here. So it's he a finds, land. He finds a Swamp. And there is an Obsidat in his hand. Right. So we're going to see an attack here for four.
Will Lundquist pull the trigger on something here? Demir Charm. All right, so we're going to swat away one of the tokens and fall to four. Nope. And I assume we're just going to go for opposite out here. But yeah, it's pretty hard not to, right? It forces Lundquist to have an Essence Scatter or a Syncopate. That's pretty much it. He's already burned one Syncopate. Here's opposite at. You see Ben look through his hand. And now he knows he's in trouble That's and it. he does concede the game. So Steve Bartzenek is going to win this match. Two games to one over Ben Lundquist playing Esper Control. That's how you thought the game would have to go for him to be able to win it. Yep. And that's exactly how it went. Yes, he did have those Merciless Evictions. Yes, he did have those Mutilates. But the Lingering Souls in combination with a little bit of Blind Obedience extorts and an Obsidat is going to be enough to take it down as Ben did just have some man issues. And, and you had to wonder, I mean, that one turn where Ben, it looked like at least to us that he mistapped his mana and wasn't yeah. able to fire off that thing twice. Who knows how differently that game goes if he's able to find, you know, he ends up with... With mana issues the whole way, he's tight on mana at certain points, and it could have been a huge deal. That, yeah. that one mishap 